Let's do it. Well, everybody, welcome back to the Storybox podcast. Today, I'm delighted to welcome an absolute legend. For those of you who don't know who this incredible man is, you're about to find out. Matthew McConaughey is an Academy Award winning actor known for the roles in films like Days and Confused. All right, all right, all right. I'm pretty sure you've heard that so many, many, so many times before. Magic Mike, Ghosts of Girlfriends Past, which is an absolute funny film. I absolutely love it. He's another favorite of mine, Sahara, which I wish you made number two of that. How to Lose yeah. a Guy in 10 Days, which is another funny film. Pool's Gold, The Wolf of Wall Street. Mm, I had to do that. <laughs> um, Interstellar, The Lincoln Lawyer, The Gentleman, which another great film. Kubo and the Two Strings, Dallas Buyers Club, uh, and the hit TV show, True Detective. You're also a minister of culture, a professor, creative director, and you also have a very, very engaging uh, creative book called Green Lights, which we're going to touch on today. Uh, it's also very funny. Matthew McConaughey, g'day, and welcome to the Storybox podcast. Good day back to you. Good to be on Storybox. Let's tell some stories. Let's do it. Uh, the first question that I have for you, Matthew, a friend of mine actually sent me a video with you doing a, an address to a university. And yeah. in that address, you're talking about success and you also mention it in your book. So my first question to you, I, I've always wanted to ask you this, but what does success look like to you? Wow. Yeah. Um, well, look on a, on a, on a, on a daily basis, trying to live a day where I can sleep well at night with what I did and who I was that day. Um, you know, I'm 51 now I've built some, you know, success is different to me now. My values are different now than say when I was 25, I've got, I'm married, I've got three children. So I'm, I'm building things and my one of my greatest successes would be if my three children go off and leave the nest and become autonomous, confident, conscientious individuals who maybe one day I'll be best friends with because that day's not yet. I got fathering to do. And yeah, I'm their friend, but I'd be doing them a disservice to be their best friend now. Um, but one day. Um, so to be a good father, to be a good husband. Um, to not half-ass it, uh, to, 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 to find something. We, I don't think we're all able to do it as careers. I don't think it's possible for everyone to do what we love to do. If everyone only did what we love to do, the unemployment would be through the, through the roof. You know what I mean? Um, I have been fortunate to find something and learn a way to love what I do and actually, uh, be pretty good at it. Um, I, I, I like, you know, success. And a simple nut nut form is getting what you want. Um, and I think the the question then that we that that opens up the, the the word success is our challenge now is defining what success is to us because the world says it's money and fame. That's it. You know, screw somebody over along the way, blah blah. To get the money and fame, you're successful. Well, I would you know I I I don't necessarily think so. Um, and I'm someone who has money and fame. You know, um, and, and I've succeeded in my career, but I also uh, what's before succeeding in my careers, I, I challenge myself to say, how successfully were you the man that you can be and are and are and have been trying to be and yearn to be in your life today? Mm. That's an amazing response to the question. And two questions that I have for you coming out of that, you mentioned being a good father to your kids, being a good friend as well. And I've always been curious because I'm not a dad yet, Matthew, and I, I do want to be one day. And I love how you mentioned in your book that all you wanted to be pretty much was a dad. And yeah. I'm curious, when you did become a dad, was it anything like you had it in, envisioned in your brain? And what does it mean to be a good father? Well, yeah, it, it was a lot like I'd envisioned. But then it was also more. And then I also, as any parent out there knows, the first big shock is that you realize, oh, it's more DNA than environment than I thought. It's like, oh, they're biologically, they kind of are who they are. We can shepherd them along, you know, and I always thought it was much more cultural or environmental and that as parents, we can really shape who they are, which I don't, I don't believe is true. You can do that. You can shape 
where they go, how they get there, um, uh, you know, what kind of character they have along the way. But boy, they are who they are, and they prove that every single day. Um, how much DNA matters. Um, look, being a good parent, you know, someone just sent me a, a, a quote that um, I had said years ago, and I forgot I'd said it, but it was a buddy of mine. Actually, Woody just sent it to me. He just this mm-hmm. morning said, uh, hey, love this, and I opened it up, and it was a quote that said, um, you want to be a uh, – you want to be a good father to your kids, um, show them how much you love their mother. Uh-huh. Matthew McConaughey. And I was like, Oh yeah, I did say that. And I was like, oh, my dad told me that. And that's a, that's a really, that's a really, a really good one. You know, as far as when we're talking about parenting and how to be a good father, you know, fatherhood, as we know, as, as, as we know, but sometimes don't, don't like to admit it's more than just making a baby. <laughs> fatherhood is a verb. You know, you can become a dad by biologically creating a child with a woman, but boy, father being a father, that's a verb. That's, mm-hmm. you know, by scale of things, at least in my household, how I was raised, that's 18 years of intense labor. Uh, zero from the, when they're born till they're 18, you're 18. Hopefully they'll be well equipped enough to leave the coop and go off and do their own thing. Um, for some people it's longer than that. For some people it's shorter than that, but generally speaking, it's 18 years of intense hand to hand labor. Um, and it doesn't stop. I think when the kids get out, but if you, you know, if a parent does a well enough job, you hopefully can see from afar that this person is autonomous and able to handle themselves because you did a good job as a father or a parent while they were in your house by equipping them to go out and negotiate the world independently. Um, yeah. So putting in the time as we all, as parents all know, saying no is a hell of a lot harder than saying yes. The yeses are easy. The yes is if you say yes, man, it's easy. You and you and your, me and Camilla get to bed on time. We got time to have a cocktail. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all go do that. Yeah, sure. Y'all go do that. You get more private time. Well, but if you got to say no and do what you think is good for them by having, having them sacrifice something they may want. That's work, man. That's that takes time, especially if you're going to talk it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or explain it to them, or try to get them to understand it. Um, but you know what? The, the the baseline also is. I heard this. My mother told me this. You know what I mean? If you don't know what to do, and every parent gets, you, every new parent gets handed a thousand books on how to be a good parent. Well, the baseline of all of it is if you love them, you can't go wrong. Mm. But loving them doesn't mean being their best friend and giving them everything they want. It's like you don't want to give it, don't want to give anyone too much candy. That's not really loving them when their teeth rot out. You <laughs> really love them? No, you got to. You know, there's certain things that you have to say. No, that's enough of that, and you can only have a little bit of this and such. Yeah. Mm, I love it. Has there been a, a question that your kids have sort of shocked you with that you didn't know the answer to? Uh, many. As every parent out there listening, you know, we have those times where our kids ask us a question and we realize that right then, live, our answer better be real damn good because this answer is going to shape this child's perspective on a whole lot of things going on in life. You can feel it when it happens. Um, You know, when my son came to me and said, Popeye, which is what he calls me. He, we had Levi, he was born, but Camilla and I weren't married. Mm. He comes to me and says, Papa, why isn't mama a McConaughey? I'm a McConaughey. You're a McConaughey. My little sister Vita's a McConaughey. Why isn't mama a McConaughey? Well, I go right there. I'm like, D- I, you know, in, in my head, it goes off. This better be a great answer. <laughs> and it was a hell of a question. And I did my best to explain it. Or... You know, you know, we he was down on a film in uh, Free State of Jones. I did in uh, um, about the Civil War, and there was a scene in which there was a hanging, and it was a it was a black slave that was hanging. And I was, you know, I always think in these movies I go to, how much do I let my kids come see what it is I'm doing? And I chose to say, you know what, I am allow my son to come down and see this because, and I know this is going to open up some major questions, and it should. Mm. And then when he's staring at that, going over these graphics, understanding, and I'm trying to say this was a part of history, and this was only like 150 years ago, so I was opening it up to talk about it. 
And then him saying, after a few days, well, why is it only someone with dark skin? Mm. Oh, major big, here we go. I pop by, I immediately goes, oh man, I better have a great answer and not a short answer because this is going to shape my son's vision of, 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 of history, of where we are, where we can go. So when they ask some big questions like that, every parent knows. <laughs> and then the other thing is we're going to find out there's probably a lot of questions they've asked. And we didn't think we had to have the right answers that we're going to find out later that they took really literally. <laughs> and we're going to go, oh, I wish I would have had a better answer for that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel the same way. Like growing up and whenever I was always a curious kid. So I would always ask adults these kind of like weird, wild questions. Yeah. And they would always tell me, like, I feel like some of them were lying to me just to get me, just to get me yeah. to go away. <laughs> so, I had this happen to me too, many times. Yeah. And I'm Many always times. like, should we actually be like sort of lying or extending the truth a little bit to, to our kids? So right. what, what's your advice around that? Well, look, I mean, I grew up in a household of why? Because I said, because I said so. <laughs> Not explaining anything. You know what I mean? Because I said, because I'm your mom, because I'm your dad and because I said so. Yeah. Figure it out. You know, I don't do, I don't understand the whys. I don't understand the context. It's just because they said so. Okay. Um, and you know, our mo modern day societies, and I know we do in our household, we discuss a lot more with mm -hmm. our children. We debate more, we explain more. Um, and then there's some assets to that, um, to an extent, I think, <laughs> um, look, you know, the message in the messenger, there's a gap. All of us will, at some time sort of find out there was a gap between the message and the messenger that our parents were to us. Mm. And, you know, sometimes those are, when my father passed away, I found out things about him that I was like, what? No, that's actually exactly the opposite of what he taught me. Mm. Well, I can either hold that and be like pissed off and feel like I was duped but I then realized pretty quickly that, oh, actually what he was teaching me was he was trying to want me to be a little better at than him. Maybe he didn't live up to that, but that doesn't devalue the value he was trying to instill in me. Hmm. All right. So, and then you have malaprops, you know, I mean, I asked my dog on head, head of school master when I was in kindergarten, I was looking up at a cloud. I said, how big is that cloud? Is that cloud as big as the world? And he told me, yes, <laughs> that cloud's as big as the world. So for 20 years, I thought, well, if I can see the edges of that cloud mm -hmm. and it's as big as the world, that must mean that space is so far off, I'll never get there. So forget being an, uh, an astronaut. I'll just work on being a sailor because that's just too far. Then I get in my first plane ride and I'm 19 years old. And in 30 seconds, you're in a cloud. So I'm going, well, a plane must be able to go a Google miles an hour. A plane must be able to go a billion miles an hour. If it got that far into that new world that I could see the outline from the earth with the naked eye. So my whole perspective of distance perception and spatial perception of the cosmos was very much grounded because I thought that anything off the ground was just unattainable. Mm -hmm. So that kept me actually from being a dreamer. Mm -hmm. It made me be a pragmatician. Look at the ground, handle what's right in front of you. Don't have lofty dreams of what you what you can maybe do that's that that's not a reality right in front of you. Well, I guess I did dream along the way somewhere, but that practicality, I would say, led me to go to understand that I do not believe in the old adage, if you dream it, you can do it. No, you've got to you gotta put in a lot of pragmatic work to chase down a dream. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I talk about that in the book, conservative, early liberal, late. That was a very conservative ethos, ideology, perspective of the world that I was given via a malaprop and a fib that my headmaster told me. Mm. That cloud was not as big as the world. The cloud was just between 12,000 feet up in the air. Mm. Cloud, cloud wasn't as big as this county. Cloud wasn't as big as this field. <laughs> You know what I mean? But that perspective for 20 years made me go, well, forget whatever's out there. I'm dealing with what's right in front of me. Mm. You know, so we get these things that can, that and at a young age, that can really are written in our lineage and, and, and have, we see the world through that lens and it can be healthy. It can be unhealthy. It can be true. It can be untrue. Um, it can be a malaprop. You can, you know, you can, you can, you know, 
So yeah, I mean, I've had some white lies told to me. You know what I mean? I remember they, I remember this other one in school. I was like, I yawned, and the teacher was like, um, why? Are you? I, she was like, why are you yawning? I said, well, I'm. I, because I'm I'm tired. She goes, no, you're not. Ti- you're not yawning because you're tired. You're yawning because your brain needs oxygen. And so for ten years, I was like, oh, you don't yawn because you're tired. You yawn because your brain needs oxygen. Then at seventeen years, I'm like, but your brain needs oxygen when you're tired. <laughs> you know. And then this, this teacher told me like unequivocally, no, it's not because you're tired. It's because your brain needs oxygen. There's a difference. Like, okay. And I'm like, oh, well, you wait a minute. <laughs> you know. I think I was told the exact same thing growing up. And I, I, did, I was always, I always questioned like, how is that possible? Like I'm yawning. The, the oxygen goes in anyway. How does that work? Like, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, like I think kids these days are kind of like the what, what I've seen. I used to work with kids as well. They used to come up with me, come up to me and have the, the weirdest possible questions. Um, like why doesn't why doesn't this uh, circle fit into the the square peg? I'm like I don't right. know. Like just <laughs> right. I didn't right. I didn't have an answer to those kinds of questions. But the to see the see the the sheer curiosity on that child's face and yeah. to feel com- comfortable enough to come up to you and ask. But right. then as a as a, when I older a little bit, I saw kids that didn't want to, they sort of had, they were afraid to ask those kinds of questions, the the difficult questions to go a little bit deeper. And I I think it's like, it's a tragedy in in such a, in so many ways that kids are sort of losing that ability to ask those difficult questions to people. Well, I mean, I'll say this. I do think we often don't give or give kids enough credit for handling, being able to handle the truth. Mm. You know what I mean? I write, I write in a book. I don't want to hide my kids from how much the truth can burn. What I want to hide them from is these fictional fantasies that they may think are real. Yeah. It's like, what do I, you know, what do I allow our kids to go see on the, on, on, or, or go online to see? Well, my me- best I can do for my measurement is this. I'm like, look, if it's a documentary, if it's something like, Free State of Jones, a true story told about the Civil War. Man, that's a harsh history, but it happened. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, uh, animals in the wild, you know, uh, predators. Yes, that's that's Mother Nature. That's how that that's how it works. But then to go into, uh, you know, a movie or a program or a game even where you're fictionally don't bleed if you get shot and you shoot whatever to go get money and then and, and 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 you don't save you don't help someone out in need because they're the good guy because you get more points I, i'm like going whoa wait 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 a minute wait, 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 wait. i don't like how that what that's maybe teaching my the kids to say it's okay or you don't have to care as much or don't have to give a damn about it the human life as much um and and it's, I don't, and sometimes it's not okay to go yeah but it's just a game mm. because I do believe that over time when kids go, well, but it's just a game. They start, that starts to bleed into fantasy bleeds into reality. And then they kind of look at life. Well, life's just a game. Mm. And yes, it is, but it's real. And it has real consequences. And, 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 um, both, you know, to us and out from us. Um, so I don't want my kids to go see a movie or watch a TV show where they are going to, for the first time, see a reality that may first off confuse them, but I don't want, I don't want that program to be their first teaching. Mm. I want them to be old enough to have an understanding that and see it from me or their mother and have us introduce them to that. um, That that is part of reality and people do do that, whether, you know, whatever it is, have an understanding and then they can go see the fictionalized version. But I want them to see the nonfiction version first. And that's what I mean by block and tackle before you play wide out. Learn, you know, conservative very liberal late. Let's 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 make sure we're getting off to and understanding nonfiction, actuality, <laughs> truth, real life first before we go into fantasy land. Yeah. Because if you go to fantasy land too quick and you start living in only the imagination too soon, you come back and you have a false 
mm. relationship with with reality. Yeah. Speaking about reality and and dreaming and and everything like that, has any of your kids told you or asked you about purpose and and what that really means and what like has any of your kids come up to you and said, "Dad, I want to be this when I grow up." And what do you normally say to them about doing that well, thing or when they ask, and a few of them have said, you know, I want to do this, I want to do that. Um, I'm always affirmative. Great. I'll do, me and your mother will do whatever you need to help you do that. But saying you want to do that, uh, there are steps you have to do to get there. Mm-hmm. Oh, VD, you want to be a... Uh, um, fashion designer well you're gonna have to sew first well but i don't like the sewing well um, okay well draw draw it up if if, if if what you can draw up the world will demand mm-hmm. good on you mm, unlikely better learn how to sew first mm-hmm. you know what i mean and create that and you know what i mean so you know kids have an idea i want to be this and it's another thing. You can go online and kind of almost be it, <laughs> like an expert in it in 15 minutes, but that's not completely real either. So, you know, um, someone wants to, you know, build houses. Okay. I'll get you an internship down at the local architect friend of mine. But that means you're going to go to his office for two hours a day and sit there and learn. Okay, great. He does that, loves it. Well, after a couple of weeks, that two hours is scheduled at the same time that he's supposed to go play with his buddies, mm. play some sport. Yeah, but I don't want to miss. Well, okay, which one do you, which one do you want to do? I mean, we can. I mean, it's going to be your choice. But you understand, if you want to go do this other one, you're not going to be chasing down that thing that you want to be as an architect. So you know, right now they're still picking things out and making a chase, and and they're starting to find each one of them is finding a theme, and we're trying to put more things in front of them that can help them grow and become aversion in the area. Like I could tell you what I think each one's going to, what kind of general area they'll be in. Like if one, I've got a couple that'll be, I think in the creative areas, another that I don't think that I'll think will be very scientific um, and, 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 and mathematical and numbers. Um, but, you know, we have, usually when we're kids, the things we're bringing up, I know for me, the things I brought up to my dad that I wanted to be until I was 18, they were fads. You know what I mean? To talk him into getting me elbow pads and knee pads for my skateboard. Well, man, that was going to cost a little extra money. So I need to do a damn good sales pitch <laughs> and prove to him and convince him anyway, not prove to him, but convince him that I really wanted to skateboard and that I was really going to take that up as a real hobby practice and maybe even try to be good enough to pursue it further. Mm-hmm. He got me the elbow pads and the knee pads. Man, I skateboarded for a month. Put them up. That's why, as I write in the book, there was serendipity that my dad was alive for the first five days into the very first film I made, Days Confused, before he died, five days in. He at least was alive to overlap me beginning to start something that would become a career and was more than a fad or a wannabe hobby or a one off or you know, knee and elbow pads for the skateboard when I was 14 years old. You know what I mean? So, cause I kind of would always, that I got later in life regretted some of those things. I was like, no, I promise. I really want to do this. I really want to do this. And then I'd stick to it for not, not, not near long enough, you know? Um, but you know, I, I think we're trying to, I think every parent can go, Hey, we want to put more. Don't ask your kids. What do you want to do? Ask your kids. What do you love? And if you love something, and then measure, do they have an innate ability to actually be maybe good at what they love? Because that'd be a big bonus. As I said earlier, we can't all do what we love. But man, if possible, if we can try to say, am I, can I be really good at something I love? And then question now in the world of economics and money makes the world go around. Is that something, can I say, is that supply something that the world demands? Mm-hmm. If you want to make a living at it, if you want to have make money to have, create a lifestyle for yourself that can be helpful, it better damn well be in demand. You know what I mean? So that's some of the things we talk about. I talk about with mine. 
No, I love it. And I love how you, you brought it back to your dad and how it kind of overlapped and he got to actually witness because in the book, you talk about when you actually told your dad that you wanted to go into acting and your dad's response was some of the, like, it was so poetic. Yep. Don't half-ass it. Don't half it. I, I was just like, damn, <laughs> that, I, that hit right to the core because it's like he just gave you approval. He just gave you approval then. And, and he gave me more than approval. He yeah. gave me more than privilege. He gave me freedom. He gave me responsibility. He gave me accountability. He gave me a kick in the ass. Mm. He gave me some grit to say, okay, one-way ticket, son. Get it. Don't half-ass it. You know? Woo. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's an under that's an underrated thing that I think more everybody, more of all of us could carry around in our pocket. You know, don't, don't, don't half ass it. It's, it's, we, cause we have a tendency to half ass a lot of things. And even if it's like, you know, I write this in the book about like, sometimes it's not the choice you make. It's just like, make a choice, commit to it. Yeah. Don't half ass that choice. Cause we often have a couple of choices about what do we want to do going forward? And we measure A out and we measure B out. I'm like, ah, I think I want to do this one. Ah, maybe I want to do this one. Ah, oh, I think I want to ask right. No, I'm not going to ask right. And all of a sudden we look up. It can be years later and we're still sitting there on the tightrope where it's like, and the world's passed us by or that girl we wanted to ask, she's gone. She's moved to another town. You're like, oh, I never just took an action to find out. Mm. And a lot of times it's like, just take the leap. Jump one way or the other. If you're not sure what you want to do, pick one. Don't half-ass it. It will reveal whether it was the right one, or it may reveal a new path that you didn't even know about. And, or it will reveal being the wrong one. You go, now I know I should have picked the other one. And now I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of times it's that just dive in. If you're going to do it. Yeah. Don't, don't half ass it. And you'll find out if it was the worth it or not. If you half ass it, you're kind of, you know, you're tiptoeing through stuff. And you're not meaning you're renting. You're not, you're never owning. You always have a return ticket in your back pocket you know you got a safety net you got an out you got a crutch you got a net you know so uh you don't really find out or give something the justice it deserves to find out if it's for you or not mm. if you half-ass it my grandfather used to always tell me he's like if you do a job he's like you do an excellent uh you have an excellent spirit first and foremost and you do the very very best you possibly can and if you if you want to do something, it was very similar to what your dad said. He's he's just like, go and do it, give it a go. He's like, even if you fail along the way, that's okay. As as long as you are trying to at least picking yourself back up. And yeah. for my grandfather, it was more about the attitude throughout the process. If I had yeah, a yeah. bad attitude, he would discipline me for the bad attitude. He wouldn't discipline yeah. me for doing a bad job. It was more the more or less the attitude because that. Yeah that actually brings out the best kind of work. So I, I, I hear you, man. I agree with you. We, you know, my dad was, was similar in the way, in the means that my mom cared if we made the A's or the B's. Dad cared about, did you have an S or a U, which was S for satisfactory behavior or a U for unsatisfactory. A U on the report card? Mm. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> He'd rather you make a, a a C or even an F and fail the class, but have satisfactory behavior. He could not put up with unsatisfactory behavior. <laughs> not tolerated. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of times that like, cause my, my mom had the same philosophy. My dad was about the A's and the B's. He's like, why didn't you get an A? I'm like, because I'm dumb. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> mom was all about, okay, I want to see how the teachers, your cause it was about your character. And for my family, character was the most important thing because my parents were always like, you can't take grades to heaven. You take your character to heaven with you. Nice. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do, do the very best that I can. And also my grandfather's words um, kept coming back to me because I remember this one time real quick, uh, I had a stinking attitude uh, going to my grandfather's place and we normally would actually mow his lawn and I, it was a stinking hot day. Uh, I didn't want to do it, but he asked me to do it. And he noticed that I had a bad attitude and I was complaining even before I started. So he's smiling and I'm like, why is he smiling? Cause, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm mowing the lawn 
you know, under my breath, I'm, I'm complaining. My face is, I'm, I have a very expressive face. So you could see that I was angry. I was frustrated. So when I finish, I, I go to my grandfather and he'd normally give us uh, like $20 for, for pocket money. I didn't get my $20. And I'm like, Hey, Grandy, why didn't I get my $20? He said, cause you had a bad attitude the entire time. I said, but I did the work. He said, no, you had a bad attitude. So I don't reward bad attitudes. Mm-hmm. And that was like a slap in the face. Like, hang right. on a minute. Maybe if I had a good attitude and I did a good job still, I did yeah. a terrible job, by the way. I just did the worst possible <laughs> one job ever. <laughs> he, he's point that out. He's pointing out the attitude of it. Yeah. yeah. But uh, to him, that was, yeah, that was the most important thing. And I think like I, as, as a, as a 24 year old now, I sort of try and teach that to young people, even to um, hopefully my kids one day, I want to instill that in them. So they have good value systems, good character, because that's the most important thing ever. It, man, I think it is. And I think what, what, what we fail to understand sometimes is that it's actually very self-serving to have a good attitude, to have even good manners. Mm-hmm. It's actually self-serving, meaning my kids understand they say yes or no, sir, please, and thank you out of respect. But I also tell them, I'm like going, hey, man, bees come to the honey. You're going to get more of what you want in life with good manners and good character and a good attitude. You're actually going to get more of what you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, another, another, another lawnmower story that I'll throw out. <laughs> It's not in the book, um, but it's a great story. One of the things that you couldn't say in, in, in our family that you were, you got the belt for saying the word C-A-N-T, can't. Mm. I remember one Saturday morning, I had to do my chores. One of those was mow the lawn. And I've got a push mower and I'm trying to crank this thing. It's got gas in it, but damn it, it won't start. I go inside to my dad. I said, dad, I can't get the lawnmower started. As soon as I said it, he, I saw his molars meet. <clears throat> he turned a minute and I went in my head, oh shit. Like I know that I'm not supposed to say that word. He quietly got up, walked with me out of his bedroom, through the kitchen, through the garage, out around the backyard to the shed where I had the city lawnmower that I was not starting for me. He hadn't said a word this whole time. He walks quietly. He goes down. He tries to start the lawnmower. It does not start. He tinkers around, gets a screwdriver, finds a little hose that he was unhooked. That maybe it was the gas lump. Reconnects it, gets gas to the carburetor. Boom! Cranks it right up. With the lawnmower now running, and this has been about ten minutes without him saying a word since I went to him and said I can't get the lawnmower started. With the lawnmower now running about ten feet away from us, he comes to me in front of my face, puts both hands on my shoulders, gets down to my eye level, and goes, "You see, son." You were just having trouble. <laughs> Bing, big difference. You know, and that's what he was, it was another thing he was a big on. No, 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 you can, you can, you can have trouble doing something, but don't, don't say you can't. And I realized then that there are things that we personally are unable to do. You know, I can't dunk a basketball. Well, if you go get a ladder, you can, you know what I mean? Or, or, or someone boosts you up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's certain things or, you know, that you're having trouble. You can go to somebody else for, for help because you're having trouble doing something. And that, um, that probably is a, is, is, is a, a value he instilled in us that gave me and my two older bro- other brothers, a lot of resilience of just being unable to, get what we want or get, make something happen, but not stop, get up, dust yourself off, either try again and get what we want via endurance and persistence or back up and go, I'm going to reapproach this. I'm going to go ask my dad for help to get the lawnmower started, whatever that is. Ah, now I got it started. So, and that's a lot of the, uh, the, the, the theory behind the title of the book, Green Lights. When I talk about what do you, you know, sometimes it's about persistence. Sometimes it's about pivoting, backing up and going, Hey, how am I looking at this circumstance or crisis in my life? I keep banging my head against the same damn wall. Well, why? Do I need to come out and look at it from a different way? Do I need to approach it differently? Do I need to find another wall to bang on? Because maybe this wall, this this wall's not my wall. I'm going to break down. You know. So yeah, I, I, that that was a that was a fun another speaking of lawnmowers. I love it. <laughs> this is a great story, and I love how you mentioned persistence there because. 
just real quickly, I have a, a saying that I often share to people and I think you might like it. It's be persistent to remain consistent are the things that you want. And most often than not, people, what they do is they persistently go the wrong way. They persistently right. get stuck in the negative and, and having trouble, like I can't do this. And they're right. constantly telling themselves that. But what if we reverse engineered it and said, yep. I can persistently do stuff. I can persistently find a way. And then when I am persistent, then things will start flowing on for me. That's yep. where the consistency yep. will come into yep. fruition. And I, I realize that for whatever aspect in my life, that if it's relationships, my business, health, no matter what it is, if I am persistently doing the good things like communication with people, yeah. um, actually going up to someone, being kind to them, you, you name it, then that is going to have a good flow on effect yeah. for us later on. And it's going it's to a process. Yeah. It's a process. Exactly. Yeah. It, it just works. <laughs> and it, it's music. It's the music of life, I believe. I mean, you, you consistently put out from your soul, you, you begin to the world bounces back with the same tune. Mm. You know what I mean? What you give it out, you consistently give it out. It will, it will start to reverb. The echo will come back from the world in relationships, in jobs, in business, and in, in, in how you greet the day. It, it will start to come back with the same voice of the soul you gave it. You know, and it goes the other way. If mm. you want to go be a, a cynical turd, you're gonna, <laughs> that's the music you're going to get back. Mm. You know, um, yeah, you know, one of the in my my uh, metaphor of, of the green lights, you know, and how the yellow lights and the red lights eventually turn green. Somebody brought this up about a month ago. I was talking with him. He was like, you know, the art. Is in what you do at the yellow light. I was like, how do you mean? He was like, well, and it clicked. I understood right when I asked the question. I was like, oh, yeah, because sometimes you see a yellow light in life. It means slow down. And if you slow down, it's eventually going to turn red, which means you're going to have to stop and get introspective and reassess, look back, things we don't like to do. And that could be very good. But what I think so many of us have, and parlaying on what you were, what you were just harping on, is too many times we slow down for that yellow light because we're like, oh, I think I need to give this crisis credit. And then we end up at a red and we like to dwell in the red light. And all of a sudden that crisis, that little molehill becomes a mountain and we're, we're just stuck in this red light and I'm a victim and all of my God, all this stuff is so hard. When actually what we should have done is seen that yellow light sometimes and said, oh, I see that possible crisis. I'm pressing the gas and I ain't giving that crisis credit. I'm blowing through this yellow light. I'm turning it green by cheerily stepping on the gas because I don't want to give that credit. And some of our crisis, some of the crises that we create, the false drama we create, they don't deserve our credit. And boy, it's better when we don't waste our damn time creating the false drama because the real drama is coming. The real red lights are coming and we ain't got a choice whether we got to stop at them. Someone's going to get sick. You know, someone's going to die. Someone's going to happen. It's going to happen not by our own doing. So I think we've got to watch that sort of masochistic uh, uh, maneuver sometimes instinct we have to create dramas for ourselves or dwell in dramas that really don't deserve our time or credit. Yeah. If I was to look at my life, I think you just explained that perfectly because if I was to look at my life and all the times that I've had a lot of yellow lights and I've had quite a few red lights actually, but I've had more green lights, but I just haven't noticed them until much later on that mm. I thought they were actually red lights at the time but they ended up being green lights. Just, I didn't, I didn't realize it until yeah, yeah. I looked back on it and said, hang on a minute. That was actually for my benefit. And it was actually pushing me in this trajectory to lead me to a good place. And yep. I, I always say this, God always brings us to where we need to be. It might not exactly be where we want to be, but it's always where we need to be. And yeah. that, that's the green light. <laughs> yeah. That is. Light. Yeah, it is. And, you know, in that, you know, I think I, I would love to, for my opinion, saying, hey, what I think you mean by that is also saying it, because what she says is a very fatalist comment. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what? You know, and people, people say it all the time and with religions. Well, hey, inshallah, good Lord willing, say es la bien. Well, hey, it is the life. Or, you know, if, 
if God wills it. Uh, and I understand that. At the same time, I think a lot of times we go to that as almost a, uh, 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 what do you call it? What's the word? Almost like a default get out. Yeah. To say, well, I don't have to take responsibility. I can. T- I don't have to put my hands on the wheel and self determine where I'm going because, hey, I mean, it's all. It's already been written. It, whatever's going to happen. But it's a mix of the two, and I think if you're a believer, or even if you're not, the way life works just on earth is that it's fate and responsibility. It, we are self determining individuals, and to say, hey. If I'm a believer, God may not give me what I want, but what I need is extremely true. Mm. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that you go, okay, so whatever happens, because if that's the if that's the theory alone, independent of responsibility, then go out there and run every damn red light and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's good. Yeah. That is very good. I like that. Fantastic. Um, Matthew, I do want to be respectful of your time. So two more, two more questions. I've really enjoyed yeah. this conversation. I wish we could go longer. Um, but okay, this one, what has been the worst piece of advice that you've ever received from someone? Success is not giving a shit. Mm. I get what they meant. And I remember it was a friend of mine who said that. And there was value in it because he said it to me at a time when I was maybe given too much of a damn about what other people thought. And so what he meant was, hey, quit giving so much of a damn about what other people think. And you know, you've you've you're successful. You've made it. Who cares? But what he leaned into what he started to do. And I was working with him at the time started to become like, well, we don't have to be on time for that thing, man. You're Matthew McConaughey or you don't have to t- come on, man. You're Matthew. And I leaned into it for a little bit. And I noticed, I was like, Oh, I didn't like the residuals it was giving me. I was like, no. And I would say success means giving more of a shit, but being, you know, selective about what you're giving a shit about. Um, you know, it's that, it's that, uh, a big again, back to the old, the old uh, fatalist comment that you made a minute ago. It's those times for me where I'm, you know, in the world going, oh, none of this matters. I'm not near as important as I thought I was. I'm not the center of the universe. Oh, time's been going on a long time without me. And time's going to go on a long time without with when when I'm gone. Nothing matters. Well, right in that moment is when I realize, oh, and that's why it all matters. Oh, I want to give a shit about it all. I want to know everything. I even want to know what I don't know. I want to even know that I do not know. You know what I mean? I I love to be in the know, but I also want to be in the know about what I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's uh, uh, that self is, he said, success is not giving a shit. And overall, I would say that was not great advice. Mm -hmm. I understood where he was coming from at the time. But as an overall moniker, mm, no, that's a dangerous track. That's 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 for an anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to agree. Uh, my final question for you, this is my all-time favorite question that I love asking people at the very, very end. And I've always wanted to ask you this question, okay, believe it or not, uh, ever since I started this podcast. And so imagine with me, it's a hypothetical one. So imagine that you've been able to reach the age of 100. You said you're 51 now. So you're almost there about 50 more years <laughs> or yeah, 49 more. Yeah. 49. If I can do math, but anyway, you've been able to reach the age of 100 and your friends have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic. They've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Well, it's going to have some reason, but it's going to have a whole lot of rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it probably it won't be too short. It's going to take a lot of time. 
It's gonna have some repos, but definitely a lot of rock and roll. It's gonna have some tears, but it's gonna have a lot of laughter in the soundtrack. It's gonna have some quiet moments that were actually louder than than the laughs were. Um, and it's gonna have uh, um, it's gonna feel at home wherever it is in the world. I can't wait to watch it. <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, I'm in the middle of it right now. Hopefully, or wherever I am, you know, it's live, you know. I mean, that's the really the trip that I've been on lately is like going. I like that exercise of jumping forward to our eulogy and saying what's going to be said, what's going to be our story we leave. But in realizing that is going, oh, well, you're it's live. You're you're writing it right now. We're in it. We're both in it right now, our own story. We're writing it right now. We are the author of what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's the fun part about jumping that far ahead is it doesn't paralyze you to go, oh, I'm going to die one day. It makes you go, oh, yeah, I'm dying one day. So let's get on with the living, mm -hmm. you know? Get busy living or get busy dying. Love it. You know? Such hell, make the best of it while we're going because we are going to die and we're on our way there. Yeah. But that sounds like a hoot now. Now, now let's have a better time. If you get <laughs> one take, if you only get one take, do you, do, you, do, you, you know, do you clinch up or do you say, F it, let's rock? Yeah. Make the most of it, man. Like, you only got one, one shot. So The alternative seems to suck. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Matthew, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor speaking to you today, you know, over and above. Like I, I did have planned questions, but I thought I'd go completely off track today and cool. loved it. Loved every moment of it. Where can Bye. people connect with you, find your book and learn more about you? Well, um, you can go to greenlightsbook.com. Jeez, you probably know better than I do. Is that the right information? <laughs> green lights book or the green lights book. I'm not sure. Um, but green lights is the title of the book. You can go to green lights book. It's also in bookstores anywhere. Um, I also did an audible version where I read the book, which I must say was quite a hoot because I get to do yeah. all the accents and all the, all the other stuff. So there's the audible version and there's the hardback uh, cover. And Hey, if you do check it out, which I hope you do, I hope you get something from it. Um, uh, at least a good hearty laugh. That'll make you go, Oh, all right. I'm looking forward to it more. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you. I'll make sure everything is all in the com uh, show notes below when this does come out. But Matthew McConaughey, thank you so much for coming on the Storybox podcast and sharing your stories. You are welcome. Could do it all day. Look forward to our next time.